Today is uh, Thursday, December 14th in the year 2006, and this is the beginning of an interview with uh, William John Kurth Jr. Jr. Yes. Jr. And we are conducting this interview at the office of the Macomb County Catholic Services on 15945 Canal Road in Clinton Township, Michigan. Uh, can I call you Bill? Yes, Bill. Please do. Uh, is how old are you, Bill? I'm six, 79 years and old. And you were born in 1927. 1927. And yes. you currently reside at uh, Sunday, 15651 Sunday Silence Court in Clinton Township, Michigan. Yes, correct? exactly. Okay, great. Uh, today, uh, my name is Butch Kauf, and I will be the interviewer. Um, I just met uh, Bill, and uh, today's videographer will be Paul Wilhelm, and he will be conducting uh, the CD and tape interview for us today. Good. Uh, Bill, would you state for the record what war and branch of service you served in? I served in the United States Navy during World War II. I just caught the end of World War II. Okay. Uh, well. Bill, for all intents and purposes, let's start at the beginning. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you were born, where you grew up, and uh, eventually here. How did you end up going in your branch of service? I was born in Detroit on a Sunday morning, and the church bells were ringing. But my dad was really, really taken with that. I don't know how many times I heard that. But I was born in Receiving Hospital in Detroit, and we lived on Wilshire near Connors and Gratiot, near the city airport, for a number of years until I was 16 years of age, and then we moved to Gross Point, and I finished high school in Gross Point High School. Were you drafted or did you enlist? No, I enlisted in the Navy. I did not like school. And when you do not like something, you do not do very well at that something. But my dad, now this is, you know, almost 70 years ago, my dad was insistent that I had to have at least a high school education. And I, the Gross Point High School had Newton dancing. I liked that very much, you know, you get to dance with the little girls. But as far as the schoolwork was concerned, I was not big on that. One day in the public address system, the war was on, of course, at this time, World War II. They announced on the public address system that anybody that was in the 12th grade, any part of the 12th grade, and had passing marks, and they had to go into the service, they would get their diploma. Yeah. So I announced that at the dinner table that night, and the next morning, at 9 o'clock in the morning, my dad and I were down in the Federal Building in downtown Detroit getting me signed up because I was going to get a high school diploma. <laughs> now, you would agree that 70 years ago, a 17-year-old didn't think much about school, but at your age today, obviously you know how important that was. Yes, and I would sure conduct myself a whole lot differently and do things a whole lot differently. So I assume a lot of people might versus yes. So your dad's with you at the Federal Building? And we, I enlisted in the Navy. My dad signed for me. This was in uh, March of uh, 1945. And uh, then I went into the Navy shortly thereafter. Uh, there it lies a whole nother tale. Okay, well, we're here to hear that tale. Where did, where did you go uh, after your uh, sworn oath? Well, uh, you go home, obviously, okay. and then you get your active duty notice. And I was uh, took my training at Great Lakes Naval Training Center. 
and it's kind of welcome to the world, a world that I had never known before. I had lived under a rock, so to speak. Tell, tell everybody where the Great Lakes is located. The Great Lakes is located in Illinois, just in the general Chicago area, or close to that. And how did you get there? Well, uh, I got there. We went from Detroit. They took you on a troop train uh, and uh, got you there. And I'll never forget my introduction to that when we arrived at Great Lakes. They had everybody, and I don't know how many there were of us, but there were hundreds of us. Had every, they gave everybody a box and had everybody strip. And here's this room full of guys with all these fannies sticking out. <laughs> Welcome to another world. And then, of course, they issued you your uniform and clothing. You so know. that box was to put your civilian clothes yes, in? Yes, that box was to put your civilian clothes in and ship it home. And uh, I very quickly learned how to say yes, sir, no, sir, whatever you say, sir, and just as you say, sir. And to do what I was told, when I was told, how I was told to do it. So that was your first boot camp experience. Yes. And leaving, living that sheltered life in Detroit, you had a rude awakening, I guess. Yes, so. it was a rude awakening, but you either adjust or you're in a heap of trouble. Uh, well, tell us a little about your training. Well, it was uh, very crowded quarters. Uh, you know, you could, no matter which way you reached, you were bumping into somebody. And you could only smoke when the smoking lamp was lit. And you ate at a certain time, got up at a certain time, went to bed at a certain time. Everything was regimented. You folded your clothes a certain way or rolled them and put them in your seat bag. Uh, was an entirely new life and awakening from what I had been used to. Didn't you have to wash your own clothes? Yes, you washed your own clothes. And, and of course, everything, you stenciled your name and your service number in your clothing so that one of your good friends didn't wind up with the children. <laughs> How was the physical part of uh and that, mental that part. wasn't bad at all. I was uh, in good shape when I went in, but there was some marching and calisthenics and that sort of thing, as I recall. Uh, but that that wasn't bad at all, the physical part. Of it. What about the swimming portion of it? Well, I was a good swimmer, so that was not a problem for me. It was for some guns, but it wasn't for me. And, and the mental part, uh, the learning of all the Navy codes and the... Uh, Where's my mother was the <laughs> mental part. <laughs> That's good, I like that. Yeah. 17-year-old boys belong home with their mother, or they should take their mother with them. Right. <laughs> look after them. If the truth were known, I didn't think so at the time, but at this tender age that I am now, right. I realized that. You could have used some help. Yes. <laughs> yes. So here you are, you, you're coming to the end of your boot camp and all this new learning experiences, and obviously you're uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed looking to take on uh, the enemy in this war effort. Uh, what kind of assignment were you given, or did you get any extra training? No, no, it was, they just needed semen. And it was a hurry up training session. Uh, it didn't last very long at all, Great Lakes. Then you received a, a leave, got to go home, show off your units for them, then report back and then we boarded a troop train for the West Coast. 
From where? Detroit or from Chicago? You had to go back. Yeah, you had to go back to Chicago. And you went with all of these guys that you'd been with, plus a whole bunch of others. And we went to Chicago. We went to Sh left from Chicago. And we went to Shoemaker, uh, which is near San Francisco. Um, how long of a ride was it? Too long. <laughs> it was th three days and two nights, or three nights and two days, I forget, but I recall the food was terrible, the very cramped quarters. Uh, it was not a joy at all. And I recall at one stop, someplace where they stopped for fuel or water or something. Another guy and I, another bright boy like myself, we jumped train and went into a bar in the town there. And we bought a half a pint of whiskey. And in a Navy uniform with the jumper down over your pants, we stuck the bottle in here and the jumper down over it. And as we were getting back to the train, the short patrol picked up, came up, and they never said a word. He just took his club and tapped the stomach. They knew exactly. <laughs> <laughs> They'd been through this a thousand times. Then he picked up the bottle and dropped it on the sidewalk. <laughs> Get, on, get back aboard. So you're a little devil in the beginning of your Navy career, huh? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. A little bit of fun. So anyway, uh, the trip was uneventful, uh, other than the cramped conditions and rotten food. Uh, but then we arrived at Shoemaker, and that was uh, Embark Embarkation or Debarkation Center. Is that is that on the Pacific, right there on the ocean? Or? No, it's, it's inland, near, very near San Francisco. Okay. Uh, and then we weren't there very long at all. I forget the time, it's so long ago. But then we boarded a troop ship uh, to go overseas. And this, the, the wrecks in a troop ship are five or six hot, you know, and there's barely room to turn over between them. Very cramped quarters and everybody has to get along and make along. Were you with Army people and Marine no, this, people? this was all Navy. All Navy. Marines. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, I forget how long the trip was over there, but uh, you, there was nothing to do aboard ship other than while I gag around uh, all day long and go to bed at night. Anyway, we uh, got to the Marshall Islands and they put us ashore at an island called Perry Island, which is part of the Marshall Atoll. And there was nothing to do on this island other than swim and sun and eat, you know, and have fun. We landed one day, and the very next day they picked two guys out of these hundreds of guys to catch a ship. I was one of them. <laughs> it was marvelous duty on this island. Anyway, I. Uh, then went aboard the USS Sandalwood, AN-32, a net tender. And a net tender picks up, lays, and repairs mooring buoys, submarine netting, and harbor netting, and torpedo netting. Mm -hmm. It's a workship. There were 55 guys aboard the ship, or 50, I'm just uncertain, uh, when the war was on, but then the war was over shortly after <coughs> that, and they 
cut the crew down eventually to 33. Uh, and what we did was we would pick the ship had two huge horns going out the front of it with winches and cables going over them. And you would pick up the mooring buoy on one side and then you would pick up the clump that had a big cement clump in the center and then big sea anchors on the legs, three legs going off it. You'd pick that up on the other side and you'd snake the chain back and forth on the deck of the ship. And there were eyes on the deck of the ship, built into the deck of the ship, and you'd take a line and tie each loop as you were snaking the chain up. You'd tie it, and then when they'd go to lay that, they'd lay the mooring buoy first, and then they'd trip the hook on all these anchors and clump, and you never saw anything snake go off a deck so fast in your life. You know. If you ever had your foot in it, you would have been just absolutely... But it gone. never tangled up. No, no, never tangles up. But uh, it was quite an experience. Also, when you would come alongside a mooring boy to pick it up, a seaman had to jump from the deck down onto the mooring buoy, and I would guess that's a distance of 10 feet, something like that. Uh, and you jump down, and the mooring boys had like two by fours along the side of them, and you'd jump, and you'd grab a hold of those two by fours after you, they'd throw you a hook to hook underneath, and once they hooked it, then the ship still moving, that worrying boy would, oh my goodness. Well, this was a voluntary thing. They did not force you to do this. I did this once. That's enough. That is a scary proposition, a dangerous thing. But there was two guys, there were two guys aboard that just loved doing that. They, they took care of it. But it was a work ship. Uh, and after a period of time, it was very good duty. I'm getting a little ahead of the story. After uh, it was very good duty, they had tables that you'd let down from the overhead tables and benches and maybe three or four on a side or six or whatever it was and food was served family style in bowls and you got to help yourself compared to a lot of places in the service you move your tray along and they slop <laughs> On it, you know, so it was very good duty from that standpoint. The sleeping quarters were good, and everybody was congenial. Uh, it was very, very tough duty when you were at sea, uh, if the sea was rough. Uh, this was, ship was only 100 or so feet long, and that ship would dip down, and those horns would go under the water, and when it would come up, that ship would just vibrate, and the water would just gush down the deck. Uh, it, a lot of guys were seasick. Uh, I never was seasick. I was very But you were blessed. holding on to things for dear life at times, right? <laughs> yeah, I was very blessed from that standpoint. Right. Uh, but it was a good duty. For the most part, no complaints. Now the war is still going on, and you're helping protect harbors and yeah. things like that. Uh, did you see any enemy activity anytime? No, any place? no, did not. Uh, I was spared that. Uh, I praise the Lord for that. Uh, 
that. Uh, but uh, after a period of time at, in the Marshall Islands, we were at Inuitak, uh, which was the home base in the Marshall Islands. And our entertainment was going ashore periodically, and there would be a movie. They would show a movie, and you'd sit and watch a movie, and that was the entertainment uh, that we had. Then after a period of time, we left there, and we went up to Wake Island. And Wake Island was never retaken by the American forces. It was situated off in a ways and they could just bypass it and no harm was done. We went up there a few days after the war was over and uh, the Japanese, there were still some Japanese there in the island. They were very surly, uh, you know, and they would m mumble at us and their language, and we would mumble at them in our language. But the island was very interesting. A trench had been dug so that landing craft couldn't just come up out of the water and come into the island. It was a trap <coughs> for them. And they had dug in the island. There were many light lack of another term, caves that they had, uh, where you could walk down and you were actually underground and they slept there and they had their sake, uh, their liquor, you know, there. Uh, so it was very interesting from that standpoint. And Wake Island is an atoll of three islands with an opening and that was the cruise ship stop on the way to the Orient uh, prior to the war. Uh, that was a big, there was a big hotel there, the Pan American Hotel, I understand. But everything had just been blown to smithereens, you know. Uh, so that was very interesting up there. Uh, and we rode out a hurricane. We had to, we were tied up at a mooring buoy, you know, naturally. Uh, and what we did up there was lay mooring buoys for ships so they could come in and tie up. But a hurricane came up, and everybody was ordered to go to sea, and that was kind of interesting. You know, it was just the tail end of the hurricane. But it was wild for about a day and a half. Your your little ship is uh, yeah rocking and rolling. Rocking and rolling. Yeah, a different kind of rock and rolling than what we know. Right. Music was right. Yeah. So anyway, uh, after that tour of duty at uh, Wake Island, we headed to Pearl Harbor. We were ordered home. So we got to Pearl Harbor, and it was about a 10-day trip, uh, and uh, it was uneventful other than a little rough sea, but I received a liberty along with uh, a few other guys uh, that first night of Pearl Harbor, and the first place we stopped, there was a store that sold nothing but milk for consumption on the premises. Fresh milk. And ev yeah, fresh milk. And every service man, you know, you can't imagine the number of ships coming in and out of Pearl Harbor. And everybody went there and chugged down a, a bottle of fresh milk, you know, for as much as you could drink. Because out at sea, all you had was powdered milk. Yeah, right. Uh, and then uh, there was a sign, this building that had a sign that said BAR. Uh, but, uh, you know, so the guys wanted to go in there, and we went in and we had a few beers. And then one of the guys uh, 
was big on tattoos, and he said, let's all go get a tattoo. And I said, no, thank you. I do not care to have one. Ah, oh, come on, Kurt, come on. So anyway, I went and I looked. The walls of this tattoo shop were just covered with designs. And I looked and looked and looked, and I couldn't find anything that I wanted to put on my bot. But there was great pressure from the other guys, so I had my initials tattooed on my right forearm. And my mother was not very pleased with that, and I'm not either. And the mistake I made was where I had it, the tattoo put. I should have had it put on the sole of my left foot. <laughs> you know, I'm ashamed of it, to, to be honest with you. But it did fact, I have it. So then we went to uh, Los Angeles. Uh, we pulled into Los Angeles, and again, I received the liberty, a 30-day liberty, mm -hmm. and I hightailed it home to Gross Point Woods, or Gross Point Farms, and uh, had a nice time. Uh, it was good to see family and friends, and really enjoyed it. Anyway, it came time to go back, and I boarded the train. And after, I think, a day on the train, uh, the morning, I couldn't get up. Uh, my ankles and hips were so swollen, and my knees, and I couldn't move. And so the shore patrol walks up and down the aisle on the train periodically, so when he came, I stopped him and explained to him my plight, and he said, well, just stay seated, and yeah, right. <laughs> and where <laughs> we'll, are you going to go? We'll bring food to you, and I said, then there's this matter of going to the bathroom, too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so at any rate, when we arrived in Los Angeles, uh, they had a wheelchair there for me, and uh, they got me off the train and put me in an ambulance, and they took me to the Long Beach Naval Hospital. And as they were wheeling me in this ward, the smart Alec Corman, whoever he was, it was pushing the curtain. He says, you know, this row they call death, this word they call death's row. <laughs> <laughs> so at any rate, I had rheumatic fever, and uh, I was there for maybe a week or whatever it was, and then they transferred me to a hospital in Corona, California. And I was there for six months in that hospital, getting well. And uh, my mother wanted to come and see me, but I discouraged her. I was afraid, I guess, of the ribbing you might take from the guys. You know, I was very young and, you know, silly. Doesn't uh, rheumatic fever affect the heart? Yes, yes, it does. It affects the heart. And I have residual heart damage from that that I still carry. Uh, but a doctor told me at the hospital I probably wouldn't live to be 40. But I'm 79, so I'll show you what he knows. <laughs> right. So is this going to uh, affect your service career? Are uh, they looking to uh, discharge you or what? Yes, they discharged me directly from the hospital, not directly from it, but as a result of that, I was discharged. Uh, so do you, do you think you contacted that when you were back here in Detroit on leave? Yeah, I had a very bad uh, cold. You know, I'd been used to the warmth of the Pacific. And right. This was in January, as I recall. 
So at any rate, uh, that's about my service career. Well, that's a, a very honorable and uh, exciting thing, but, uh, you know, I'm sitting here wondering sometimes, you know, what a 17, 18 year old guy felt like on the ocean. You know, it's a long way from Detroit. Uh, you know, <laughs> and I know you said you didn't get seasick, but you had to wonder, uh, you know, being on a small ship and riding out a hurricane that, uh, what am I doing here? Yeah, what am I doing here is exactly right. <laughs> but I enjoy being at sea. I like that there's a peace and a tranquility when the ocean is relatively calm. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's very nice. Uh, and it was particularly nice, I believe, being aboard such a small ship with so few guys. You knew everybody. You knew friends, uh, but uh, you learn in the service discipline of how to adjust, and you have to adjust, or you're lost. Uh, that helped you later on in life. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the organization and discipline and the ability to do what you're told, and when you're told, and how you're told, uh, that stood me in good stead, absolutely. absolutely. I wouldn't have traded it for anything. Uh, in, in, in this short period of time you were there, not too short, but were you in contact with your mom and dad back home? Oh yes, we would uh, write to back and forth. Uh, letters were slow going. Stage, you know. Nothing like getting a letter at mail call, right? Yeah, boy. Yeah, boy. It's good news. And at Christmas time, my mother had everybody she knew. Saunders used to pack boxes with candy and cake and all kinds of good. Those things just kept coming and coming and coming. You know. So you had a lot of friends then in the Navy. Everybody in the ship had a box. <laughs> You had a lot of friends because of your mom. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And, and as far as that tattoo, uh, it has nothing to do with you going into that establishment that was spelled B-A-R, did it? <laughs> that wasn't a contributing factor, was it? Well, a few beers, you know, sometimes kind of. Yeah. Loosen up your. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So now you're a young buck coming home here. Uh, are you still? on the mend when they discharge you, or you were, uh, you know? They said I was fine, but uh, it, it took a little while after that to regain full power and strength. Yeah. Uh, but I was good for the most part. So what did, what did your life proceed to do after that? Well, after that, uh, I decided to go to business school. Uh, That's for I, a guy that didn't like school? Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you learn a lot of things, you know. Yeah. So I went to business school and studied accounting. Uh, and that that was quite good. Uh, and I was walking down the aisle to my room one day, and here sat this beautiful little girl. Oh, my. My goodness. So I sat down next to her. I said, hi. She said hi, and one word led to another, and we went out. A couple of years later, we were married. Wow. Yeah, yeah. You chased her till she caught you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, during that period of time, uh, my mother was very sick uh, with breast cancer, and. They didn't know in those days what they do about breast cancer today. And uh, poor soul, she died an inch at a time over a few year period. Uh, and uh, she died uh, before uh, she could meet uh, my wife. Uh, but. Uh, our house kind of fell apart after that. Uh, I had a younger sister 
12 years old or thereabouts, and she was kind of a free spirit. And my dad didn't know what to do without a woman, and he did a little drinking, and there was chaos in the house. My older sister, her wedding had been planned, and she was married the week after my mother's funeral. And, you know, there was a lot of trauma in the house. Right. So, so at any rate, uh, when Janet came along, I met Janet, and, uh, you know, we fell in love and had a nice courtship enjoyed each other and still do. But, uh, you know, but, uh, did you start a family? Yes, we did. Uh, we have uh, two daughters uh, and uh, both of them uh, had husbands <coughs> and the oldest one has one daughter and the youngest one has two daughters. The older daughter now, there's uh, alcohol involved in her household. And she has moved, moved out of the household to escape it. Uh, and the younger daughter, she has two children uh, and a husband. They live in Petoskey, and he's superintendent of the school district mm -hmm. up there. Uh, they have a very nice wife, and uh, we're very pleased with our children. They've done well and turned out well. It's been good. And the grandchildren, my goodness, our grandson in Petoskey, he's six foot, he weighs 200 pounds. I tell everybody I used to be that way, but as you age, you shrink, you know. <laughs> hey, Rick, uh, he plays football, all the sports. And, uh, our granddaughter here is 26, and she works at Neiman Marcus. Uh, she's in charge of the human resources here at Neiman Marcus. And the other granddaughter in Petoskey is 12. She's pretty occupied with school. So there's some good in your life besides the trauma that you had. Yes, 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 absolutely, absolutely. I got a couple questions here. Yes. Uh, when you got out, did you, you stay in touch with any of your old uh, Navy buddies? I did for a, a while, but then that seemed to... Uh, did you join any uh, veterans organizations? Yes, I belong to the Disabled American Veterans. Okay. Uh, I receive a small government uh, compensation. From the rheumatic the, fever? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I belong to the Disabled American Veterans. I'm a life member of that. Well, it sounds like you're, you're enjoying the rest of your journey now. Uh, yes, I am. Uh, I, uh, I'm chaplain in a hospital in Florida. We spend six months generally out of the year in Florida, my wife and I. I'm chaplain in the hospital there in Bradenton one day a week. And I'm also chaplain in Mount Clemens General Hospital here. On Thursday morning, this is, I came direct from there. So you my, didn't get dressed up for us? my chaplain <laughs> uniform. Well, I shouldn't have said that. I should have let you <laughs> uh, Well, it sounds like we're winding up here. Is there anything that uh, you want to finish up saying? Uh, I know that uh, the time that you were in the service is a lot longer than the time thinking about it today. And that, like you said, is... <laughs> you know, 50 to 60 years ago, and time flies when you're having fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I can't think of anything else about the service. Uh, it was a great experience, and as I said, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Uh, I think everybody, when they turn 18, I think they should be made to serve a year or so in the service 
you learn respect and honor and how to take orders and do what you're told and all of these good things that are not being taught in homes today. I can remember as a boy when my mother said, don't do that, you didn't do that, you know. <laughs> a little different today in terms. Yeah, so. it sure is. Gentlemen, do you have anything you'd like to ask Bill? Any? How long have you been married? 57 years. It just was, November 25th. That's the best. Yeah, thank you. Paul, I'm anything? very proud of that, you know, few people today are it seems are married for that. But you make a commitment to a woman and you make a commitment to, in front of a whole lot of people Amen. to God. That's right. This I'm going to do. And we have done that. And like any marriage, you know, you have a little thing here, a little thing there, but you talk about it. Settle it. Move on. That's fantastic. It's uh, another honorable thing that uh, you've accomplished in your life. Uh, you know, love for your country, love for God, and love for your family and friends. So I'm very I, blessed and pleased to be able yeah. to serve the Lord the yeah. way I am able to. I've had some missionary experience in Kenya and Tanzania. Another man and myself uh, went uh, over there as evangelistic missionaries. We trained pastors in evangelism in a modified evangelism explosion gospel presentation. Mm -hmm. Then we take them out and do it through an interpreter with them and then they would gradually take over and a <coughs> fabulous experience in my life going there and seeing a different culture and, you know just very very warm loving people that just couldn't do enough for us well uh, bill i uh, i want to thank you for coming in i'm uh, very honored and proud to know you. I want to thank you for sharing your life and military expenses, experiences for us. And uh, as they say, you are uh, the greatest generation. And uh, we're honored to have your story. And it'll be going into the Veterans History Project and the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And uh, I'd like to shake your hand. Thank uh, you. Thank I'm you. I'm sorry. One other thing pleasure. here. You did bring a souvenir in. Uh, and I know you didn't want to have your picture taken with no, it, so we won't. But where did you acquire this souvenir? On Wake Island. On Wake Island? Yep. Uh, in one of those caves or yep. thereabouts? Yep. That's a uh, Japanese flag. A That's Japanese flag. That's uh, about the only souvenir. Yeah, we don't want to. I don't know if you can get that, Paul. That's just a remembrance of uh, your duty yep. and uh, why you were fighting the war. It's the only souvenir I have from the war, really. I gave my uniform to the Sea Scouts many, many years ago. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, there again, uh, we're going to conclude this interview today, and I, I thank you for coming. Thank sir. you.